Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today we are continuing our study in the Red Letter series, and we are in a topic this morning that is going to maybe rattle the cages of many, because we are going to learn from this text whether they know it or not, whether you know it or not, whether I know it or not, there are many who are living in sin, and they are doing so by the choices that they have made to follow their hearts as opposed to the Word of God. Now, many might say, I wasn't aware that that was the Word of God, that that was the rule of God, that that was the law of God. But ignorance is not an excuse for breaking the law of God because all of us have accessible to us the Word of God. And so if we are not reading it, if we are not studying it, it is no one's fault but our own. It's kind of like that old joke where a man who is in the midst of a flood asks God to deliver him from the flood. And so someone comes by and offers him a way of escape. And yet he refuses their help, stating that God is going to deliver him. As the flood waters begin to rise, he moves to the second floor. Someone in a boat comes by, offers him a way of escape. He says again, no thank you. God is going to deliver me. The flood waters now have risen so high, he's on the top of his roof. A helicopter comes by and offers him a way of escape. Again, he says, no thank you, God is going to deliver me. The flood waters continue to rise and he perishes in the flood. When he arrives before the Father in the kingdom, he asks the question why he was not delivered. And God's simple reply is, I sent you three methods of deliverance. You have no one to blame but yourself. And so it is with the word of God, friends. There are hundreds of translations of the Bible. The Bible is the number one selling book of all time. There are more printed copies of the Bible than any other text ever written. And so if you don't know the law of God, you have no one to blame but yourself because it is readily available unto us. Now, we in this ministry have encouraged you, the viewer, to take on the practice, the habit, the discipline of reading five chapters of the New Testament every single day. Nothing will alter your life, will change your life, will strengthen your spiritual journey like reading five chapters of the New Testament every single day. And if you do this, you will read the New Testament once a month. 12 times a year, 60 times in five years. Wouldn't you like to say as a follower of the Lord Jesus five years from today that you have read the New Testament 60 times? There is no greater claim to fame, friends. So I hope you understand the importance of reading the Bible and you take on the discipline as well. Well, today we are in Matthew chapter 19, and we want to begin in verse 3. So if you have your Bible, open to Matthew chapter 19, and let's begin reading together verse 3 through verse 12. Now the Pharisees, they came unto Jesus, and they were tempting him. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to trick him. And so they say unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, when they say, is it lawful, they're referring back to the law that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And notice that it says, for a man to put away his wife for every cause. That word every there is critical because the law does not allow for a man to put away his wife for every cause or a woman to put away her husband for every cause. There are very specific guidelines that divorce must fall into. And so Jesus in verse 4 answers and says unto them, Have you not read, or as we just said, the law, the word of God is readily available to you. Are you not reading it? Are you not studying it? And so he says, Have you not read 
that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. Now notice he says, God has made them male, man, female, woman, male, husband, female, wife, And for this cause, a man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too, or twain, shall be one flesh. Now, there are those who would tell us that Jesus never taught on the subject of homosexuality or lesbianism. Yet very clearly here, he is defining what marriage is before the Almighty, how it is to be honored and kept pure, and it always is a male and a female a man and a woman. And so without teaching directly on the subject, Jesus, by clearly defining what marriage is, is defining what marriage is not. It's never male and male. It's never female and female. It's always male and female, man and woman, husband and wife. Well, he continues in verse six and he says, wherefore they are no more twain or they are no more two but they have become one flesh. And what God, the Almighty, the Ageless One, what He has joined together, let no man put asunder. Let no man destroy. Now, Jesus' message here is quite literal. He's speaking to a human man and a human woman. But we would be foolish here if we overlook the fact, the spiritual implications that lie within this passage. You see, God has pursued us just as a man might pursue a relationship with his future bride. So God has pursued us in a relationship with him. And when we have given ourselves over unto that relationship, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Let us be very careful as his people where we place our affections. Because he is a jealous God, and he desires all of our love, all of our affection, and all of our devotion. So as we read this passage, let's look at both the physical aspect of it and the spiritual aspect of it. Well, now that Jesus has said this in verse 7, it says, The Pharisee said unto him, If this is true, then why did Moses, our greatest prophet, then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away. And notice what Jesus says in verse eight. He replied unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not intended so. God never desired broken relationships in the physical nor in the spiritual. And that's why when we drift from the Lord in our relationship with him, He pursues us so hotly and chastises us because a broken relationship is even ugly in his eyes. And he says, if you turn from your relationship with someone in the physical world, it's because of the hardness of your heart. And if you turn from your relationship with me in the spiritual realm, it's because of the hardness of your heart. And isn't that so true, friend? We can blame God, but none of that blame is justified. It's because of the hardness of our hearts that we turn our affections to the world and away from God. And so Jesus continues in verse 9 and says, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. Now we would define this as sexual sin, but it's even deeper than sexual sin Because sexual sin is only the final result of what's been taking place in the heart. You've given your heart to another than to the one in whom it belonged. And again, this is true in the spiritual realm as well. We give our hearts to another as opposed to God whom it belongs. And so Jesus says, if this is the case, then divorce is allowed. It is lawful. Now, if this applies in the physical world, how would this apply in the spiritual world? Well, it totally destroys the idea of once saved, always saved. Because just as a husband and wife can commit fornication or adultery, sexual sin, 
against each other and ultimately end in divorce in a separation where the two go their different ways, so it is in our relationship with God. If we sever that relationship, a spiritual divorce takes place. And what once belonged to us because of that marriage union, that oneness, no longer belongs to us because of a broken relationship. And so Jesus says, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. And so as I stated at the beginning of this study, there are many who are living in sin because of the choices that they have made. Because outside of a relationship being broken through sexual sin, anyone divorced is to remain divorced. And if they remarry another, they are committing adultery and they are causing the one to whom they have married to be committing adultery as well. And the reason for this is because they have been promised to another. And until death separates that relationship, they are to remain monogamous because it's all about the commitment that was originally made. Now, commitment is something that is very misunderstood, ignored, and not practiced in the day and age that we live in. But the Bible says it's better to never make a vow unto the Lord than to make a vow and break it. And so it's all about the vow that we have made to one another. And that's why the vow says through sickness and in health, through rich, through poor, through good days, through bad days. God understands as humans how fickle we can be, how easily we could tire from one another, but we have made a vow. And we are to stick to that vow unless the other party breaks that vow by giving themselves to another. Well, upon hearing this in verse 10, his disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. It's almost as if the disciples are saying that the commitment is so burdensome and the expectancy of purity placed upon the other in the relationship is so high that it would almost appear that the relationship will end in divorce. That divorce was a very common thing among God's people and misconduct was so prevalent. And we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 27, we are told if you are bound unto a wife, seek not to be loosed. If you are loosed from a wife, seek not a wife. In verse 32, it says, He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. He doesn't have anyone taking his time. He can give all his time all of his attention unto the things of the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things of the world, how he may please his wife, his children. And so we know from these verses, it's better not to be married. Yet Jesus says back to Matthew chapter 19, verse 11, all men cannot receive this saying. Why? Because they burn with physical passion. But God has given this gift to some. In verse 12, there are some eunuchs, some who are celibate, which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs, or some who are celibate, which were made eunuchs of men. So some were born celibate, some have been castrated by men and made celibate, and then there are those who have made themselves celibate, or eunuchs, for the kingdom of heaven's sake so that they can give all of their time, all of their attention unto the things of the Lord. And they don't pursue a relationship with another person. If you are male pursuing a woman, if you are woman pursuing a man, because they know that this is going to take time away from the time that they could spend in the things of God, reading their Bible, praying, serving others. And so what we see in this passage today is that the vows that we make to one another while we are here on this earth are to be honored. And the vows that we make unto God are to be honored just as well. And just as we are to be careful, extremely careful, about keeping ourselves pure in the relationship that we have here while on this earth, 
so too are we supposed to be extremely careful about keeping purity in our relationship with our God. Once a person has entered into a sexual relationship with someone else outside the bonds of their marriage, many steps, many flirtations have taken place leading up to that point. And so it is in our relationship with God. There are many little steps of compromise and flirtations to this world that eventually lead up to a broken relationship in our relationship with God. Somebody doesn't just wake up today and say, I think I'll go commit adultery against my wife. Nor does someone wake up and just say, I simply think I'll rebel against God today. No, it's the little steps of compromise that lead up to the ultimate action. And so let us give all of our time, all of our attention to be very careful in keeping ourselves pure in the relationships that we have while here on earth and in our relationships that we have in heaven. Now, before we close, I think the question might arise, what am I to do if I'm in a second relationship and my first relationship ended in a divorce, but it was not based on sexual promiscuity, on adultery? And ultimately, the answer boils down to this. Do you do what you want to do and remain in that relationship? Or do you do what God's word tells you to do and you leave that relationship? Because as long as you're in that relationship, according to the word of God, the words of Jesus here in Matthew 19, you are living in adultery and causing the one whom you're with to live in adultery as well. Now, I know that if you're in that situation, that's not what you want to hear, but that's the word of God, friends. And so again, the question is, do you do what you want to do or do you do what God's word says to do? Well, that's a decision that you're going to have to make in your relationship with God because you alone are going to stand before God and give account for your life. And so you can either obey or you can disobey. But be warned, friends, there's consequences to your disobedience and there's reward for your obedience. Now that addresses the question on a physical level. But what if you are one who says, I was in a relationship with God and I broke that relationship. I adulterated myself spiritually with the physical world. I pursued the world passionately and all that it has to offer. And I now realized I was seduced by it and I want to return unto the Lord. What am I to do? Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and look at verse 9. Solomon, King David's son, will one day find himself in this exact situation. And David says unto his son, Solomon, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts, And he understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found of thee. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. So we are told here that you must seek the Lord. And if you do, he will reward you for doing so. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, it says, If you will humble yourself, if you will pray, If you will seek the face of the Lord and turn from your wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven. He will forgive your sin and he will heal your land. And land would represent your heart. And so friends, if you've adulterated yourself with the things of this world and you've left the relationship that you once had with the Father, with his son Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit, I invite you today, friends, to make things right with him. You don't need an altar. You don't need a church. You don't need a preacher. Just simply bow your knee in humble surrender. Confess your sins. Allow his blood to cleanse you. And let today be the beginning of a new relationship where you do everything in his power, never to bring him hurt again. I pray that you'll do that, friends. This verse, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, changed my life many years ago, and I know that it can change yours. Well, I love you. I'm so thankful that you're with us this day. I pray that you'll walk in the blessing of God that is found through Jesus alone. 
and that you'll spend every moment of the rest of your life bringing him all the joy and pleasure that he so deserves. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I love you, and I'll see you on the next video.